the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Hey, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, so do you. Come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. Father, we just love you and thank you and bless you and praise you as we come before you. We want your word to explode on the inside of us today. Here's our hearts. Fill us with your way, your will, your want. And God, we just give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Father, we haven't come into this house to hear from a man or a woman. We have come into this house to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Father, for what you're going to do with us and blessing us. But Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and our sisters. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church and, and Trinity. We give you the praise for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field building, one kingdom. That's yours, not a man's. That's yours, your kingdom we're building. God, let all praise and glory go to you. We give you praise for the wisdom that you have. You have such diversity in your churches that there's a place for everyone, Father. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name for your mighty wisdom. In Jesus' name we all say amen. As you take your seat, get your Bible and go with me, if you will, in Hebrews... We have been out of Hebrews for a long time since Christmas, and now we're getting back. For those of you who don't know this, you need to know something. We teach line upon line, precept upon precept, the Word of God. Why? Because you need to know it that way. Why? Because God wrote it that way. Instead of just picking out this little subject and that little subject, you got to cover all the subjects when you do this. You can't get away from anything. And therefore, you grow. Now, may I say this to you? It's important that you commit your heart to the things of God by the word of the Lord. We're going to talk about that later on in today's service. But I want you to share with you. If you want to know, and I know you do, how to get blessed. Don't tell me you don't want to get blessed. You know you want to get blessed. You want to know how to prosper. You want to know how to run your businesses. You want to know how to raise your children. You want to know how to have a great marriage, how to have a happy marriage, how to love more when you're older than you did when you were younger, how to be successful in every area, how to be fulfilled in every area. There's only one way for you to learn how to do that, and that's by the Word of God. This is the manual on how to live and how to do life. This is the manual on how to be successful. And we don't just teach the Word of God here. We teach the character, nature, and the attributes of God. Because I can say something to you from the Word of the Lord, and if you don't know the character and the attributes of God that backs that, you won't understand the facets of what's being said. And therefore, we look at the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept. Why? Because God loves you. Why? Because there's a pastor that loves you so much, he cares about you, wants you, so does God, wants you to prosper in every area. Now stop it. You know you want to prosper. I'm talking about money in your pocket. I'm talking about life in every area of your life. This is how you prosper in every area of your life. It's so simple, yet so profound that it'll change your entire existence. Today as we look at Hebrews, I'm going to share with you the title of the message in a moment, 
but I want to share with you where we're going in Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written so that God would be seeing Jesus as the preeminent Christ. Most of those words you don't understand. The word preeminent means above all. It means magnified. It means greater than anybody else. You will find in the scripture here that people were worshiping angels. People put a lot of things before Jesus Christ. They put Moses before Jesus. They put the traditions of men before Jesus. They put uh, the prophets before Jesus. And all of a sudden, here comes the book of Hebrews straightening out the people, not out of only of those days, but of this day, that there's nothing in their life or yours that should be beyond or before the preeminent Christ. He is the all in all. He is alone everything you will ever need to be successful and, and, and prosperous in every area of your life. And it's all about whether or not you will take him from some position in your life to the ultimate position in your existence. And you will get blessed if you do. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. They use illustrations from different time periods of the people of the past. Here's how this works. Old Testament, for an example, we're going to read about the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. God wanted to take them to the promised land. It's not about the children of Israel going to the promised land. That's an example about your life. That's all it is, is telling you about something they did. They either did it right or they did it wrong. You learn how not to do it wrong, and you learn how to do it right by what they did. God has three ways of teaching you the Word of God. Number one, He'll tell you what to do. It's plain and simple. Number two, He'll show you how to do it. He doesn't just tell you what to do. He shows you how to do this. Number three, He will show you the pitfalls, the traps. He will, if you will, teach you by warning you and showing you the lives of people that have failed so that you don't do what they did because you could do what they did so you won't fail. Because why? God loves you. Why? God wants you successful. God wants you to prosper in every area of your life. So as we look at the word of the Lord today, we're going to be talking about the children of Israel coming into their promised land. But keep in mind, it's about you. You see, there's a promised land, your own personal promised land. God wants to take you somewhere you never thought you could go. Do something you never thought you could do. Be something you never thought you could be. God wants to bless you far beyond that which you could ever, ever imagine. But in order to get you to your promised land, you're going to have to do what these people did not do so that you might enter into the very presence of God. There in the presence of God is the power of God. Is anybody listening? And in the power of God comes a destiny and a purpose for why you are on the planet. If you ever ask the question, I don't know why I'm here. How did I get here? What's the purpose? I guess just two people got together. Now I'm here. Now I got to deal with life. Not so. God knew you before the foundation of the world and God has a perfect plan to get you into your perfect personal promised land, there is where the blessings are going to flow. And don't tell me you don't want it. And you can have it if you just follow the manual and he'll tell you how to obtain it. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Now, as we look at the word of the Lord today, I want to share with you the title of the message. Now, listen closely. Listen, before I give you the title, listen closely. If you and I operate according to the word, we get blessed. When we don't operate according to the word of God, we curse ourselves. Are you following me? Now, now listen to this. Listen to what I'm going to share with you. If that's true and you know it's true, then there's things you can do to ignite the wrath of God. We don't think and we're taught in American churches that the wrath of God was just something on the Old Testament saints. It's not true. I'll show you that in the New Testament all through there. The wrath of God 
as you're going to see in a moment, is not some big fireball coming out of God, burning up everything around you. It could be if he wanted it to be. The wrath of God is just stopping the people from going on to their blessings. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. The wrath of God can be ignited by you, starts God up, that stops you from getting to where you really need to be. Are you following me? Now let's read about it in the Word of God. We'll come back and explain it as we go. Hold on. Let me explain it to you. Let's go to third chapter. Remember, we're going line upon line. We've been about two years in the first two chapters, two and a half chapters. We're in the third chapter, starting verse number seven. Hebrews. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me. Notice the capital M and the word me, speaking of God. Where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Now listen, I want to bring you back to something. Let's, let's look at me now. 40 years? Do you think God is long-suffering, patient, puts up with our stuff a long time? For 40 years, every single day, they saw the miracles of God. When they were hungry for meat, quail walked into their camp. Every day, it rained manna from heaven. They provided. Every day, the miracle of their shoes never wore out for 40 years. Who's ever worn a pair of shoes for 40 years? Didn't work. E even Nordstrom's doesn't sell those kind of shoes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Every day, they experienced the miracles of God. Yet, these who believed in God and saw the miracles, did not get to where they needed to be because they pushed God the wrong way for 40 years. Listen, those that believed in God, if they push God the wrong way, we can too. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think for a moment you can't. You can too. I'll prove it to you by the New Testament in just a few moments. And so oftentimes we don't realize that for 40 years they saw his works and after 40 years they still didn't and wouldn't follow God the way God wanted them to be. Don't let that be your testimony. It could be. Let's go on and read. Listen to these words. Therefore, in other words, because of what I just said about their rebellion, how they tried me, how they tested me, how they pushed me, that word therefore is therefore because of what I just said. He comes along and says, therefore I was angry with that generation, I am thrilled that he put that word, that generation. He didn't say, I'm angry with all generations. The ones that failed, failed. But guess what? There's a new generation that you and I are part of, and we do not have to fail. And a lot of people come along, and they make excuses for their failure. My dad did this to me. My mom did this to me. My uncle creeped into the room when, he was 11 year, when I was 11 years old and took advantage of me. I'm the wrong color. I'm the wrong shade of, I'm not educated. I'm not smart. I don't have degrees. I don't have anything. My family in the past has been a failure. Sure. Surely I will be a failure too. Listen, that generation could have failed, but I've got good news for you. With Jesus, you're part of a new generation. And he says to them, he says, and they always went astray in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. Let me tell you something. You can know about God and not know his ways. 40 years they saw miracles every day of their life. 40 years they heard the news. 40 years they talked about the experiences of what God had done in answer of their prayers. For 40 years they marched trying to get into the promised land that God wanted to bring them to. God desired to give it to them. And yet now all of a sudden here we find that they did not know the way. How do you hang around God for 40 years and not know God? That ought to not be your testimony, but it could be. There's people that go to church every single week of their life, don't know God. 
There's people that tell you everything the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, but not know the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference between telling you what the Holy Spirit is about according to the Scripture and knowing the Holy Spirit. They did not know my capital M ways. Listen to this. So I swore by my wrath. Let's see what his wrath is. They shall not enter into my rest. No great big fireball. It's just what they wanted they didn't get. Don't let that be your testimony. That which they needed they didn't get. That which they desired they didn't get. That which they knew they could have they didn't get. That could be every one of our testimonies in here if we let it be our testimony. And for we can come into the house of God and praise his name and shout his glory. We can hear the word of the Lord and we can clap our hands and go to church and give our money. But we can still miss God if our hearts are not right with God. And that which we could have had we'll end up not having. Can you imagine how much it must have pained God not to bring that generation into the promised land? It was promised to their fathers that he would bring them there. He had prepared it for them, yet they would not trust God and go. They were stopped by the things of this world. And you and I could be stopped by the things of this world. God has greatness waiting for you. But you don't have to go there if you don't want to. But if you really want to, the place to go is where God is at. And he'll take you to the greatness. It doesn't work any other way. I found this funny little verse. It's a weird little verse in Psalms. I'll explain it to you if I may. In Psalms, I'm just going to pop it up on the overhead. The second chapter, verse number 12. The title of this message is, again is Igniting the Wrath of God. The wrath of God here was to keep the people from the blessings that God had for them. He wouldn't give them to them. Can you imagine the pain of raising a child and you worked all your life to give them an inheritance. And then you realize that they're going to take the inheritance and it's going to ruin them and ruin everything around them and absolutely destroy and defeat them. So you don't give them the inheritance as well as they were displeased. Can you imagine how God must have felt who loved these people and wanted to bring them into the promised land? Oh my in Psalms, I want to pop it up on the overhead. It says something kind of strange. It says, kiss the son, S-O-N. Least he be angry. You know, there's certain kinds of people that you walk up to, you shake their hand or you pat them on the back. There's certain kinds of people you wave at, you don't touch. There's certain kinds of greetings towards different types of people. Some you will... Give them a big slug or a knuck on the shoulders or say hi to them and give them a big hug. Some you won't even touch. But here this verse is a funny little verse. It says, kiss the son. Least he be angry. To have a kiss is an intimate thing. It's not a slap on the back. It's not a loose connection with God. It's not one except intimacy. To kiss the son is to be intimate, where you know personally your relationship and the depth of your relationship, and you're not afraid to express your heart's desire for him. And then he comes along, he says, if you don't have that kind of a relationship, at least he's angry. And he says these words, and you perish in the way. Did you know that the early church was called the way? Oftentimes we go to church and oftentimes we can be godly as we know godly people ought to be. Oftentimes we can move in some religion or tradition of men or ceremonial ritual and be in a place and still perish because we haven't had an intimate relationship with the son. Amen. Then he comes along and he says these words. He says, when his wrath is kindled but a little... In other words, we will perish even if it's just a little bit kindling of his rash, wrath. Not a lot, just a little bit. And he says these words, blessed are those who put their trust in him. Wow, what an amazing statement. It says a whole lot, doesn't it? Sometimes you read the Bible and you say to yourself, what in the world is it saying? 
Remember, it's describing itself as the hidden mysteries of God. Hidden because they're hard to find and mysteries because they're hard to figure out. But when you find them and figure them out and apply them in your life, it changes the world you live in. And that's what this is all about. Today I want to cover three little quick subjects that God gave because he loves you, gave to me to give to you. What ignites the wrath of God? I figure it this way and so does God. If you know what ignites the wrath of God, you don't do it, you won't ignite the wrath of God because you don't want the wrath of God on you. Somebody say amen. amen. What ignites the wrath of God? Three things that we need to know so that we don't do them. This is called a warning teaching. Doesn't feel as good as the shouting teaching, but it's healthy for you. It's like spinach, if you will, to Popeye. Spinach is the word, the Popeye, you're it. So let's just, number one, listen closely. What ignites the wrath of God, number one? Ignoring his word. I'll show you in a moment scripturally how the ignoring of God's word angers the Lord to the place where the wrath of God which will keep you from your personal promised land and the blessings of the future by ignoring the word of the Lord. The word ignoring is a big word. And every one of us, we're thinking something different when you hear the word ignoring. But really, the word ignoring here is when you place the word of God in a common position. Anything you put common on will become common in your life. If you treat the word of God as if it's common and not supernatural, you will find yourself in a place of believing that it's not important in your life. When in fact, this is the inspired word of God. And for thousands of years, it has been preserved for you to look into the manual of life and find out what God has to say. How to run your family, how to raise your children, how to make business investments, how to be successful in every area, how to have relationships with business and people and relatives, how to do life completely. Whatever it is that you're looking for on how to do life, this is it. This is the inspired Word of God. It may be written by men, but God inspired it behind it. And for thousands of years, at the cost of millions of people's lives and gallons of people's blood, it's been preserved for you so you could put it there and find out exactly what it is that the heart of God is saying to each and every one of us. And if you don't understand that and you don't see it as important, you'll treat it as common. And when you treat it as common, it becomes common and it doesn't become important. And what happens, you become a person who ignores what God says and you never Get into your own personal promised land. There's something about people who put an emphasis on thus saith the Lord God. And when you say thus, I don't care what the world says. Here's what God says. I don't care what the politicians say. Here's what God says. I don't care what the economists say. Here's what God says. And when you live your life by that, God backs it. Are you following me? Sometimes we don't realize how little of importance we put on the word of God. Sometimes we don't see it ourselves. Here, I'll explain it to you by this. Listen. In 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter, verse 13. In 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter, verse 13. Listen. I'm making a point right now. Listen. In 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter, verse 13. What you should have heard is 2,000 people flipping the pages of their Bible. You didn't. You only heard a few. You listen to me. I have to tell you the truth. 
not trying to be mean, not trying to be ugly. I love you. Someone needs to put down the church stuff. Put the incense away. Someone needs to stop the silly sprinkling that does no good and smoke that is no good for you at all and tell you the truth about the word of God. And I love you, respect you, and honor you enough. In a few years, I'll be 70 years old. I don't even know how many times I've ministered this weekend. The reason I do that is because I love you. And grandpa needs to tell you something because you have never heard your grandpa ever told you anything that helped you to get successful and prosperous in life. Until the sound of the pages turn in this sanctuary and flood the room, we're ignoring the word of God. I know you have iPhones, so do I. I know some of you have smartphones with your Bibles on it, and that's cool. I'm proud of you, good for you. But there's something about the Word of God in a book. One of the things I found out about the Word of God in a book is I can't just push a button and it goes away. I can't take my iPhone and drop it at a restaurant after church and have the waitress go, oh, and everybody around and all of the other tables drop their heads because there's something very convicting about the word of God. I put my iPhone down, nobody thinks anything except that old man's cool. (laughs) Something about the Bible. And we're losing a lot of Every now and then, if you have an iPhone, it's cool. But every now and then, you ought to bring your Bible and learn how to go through it and hear the sound of the pages. Every page speaks out the truth of the heartbeat of God that will change your future and bring you into prosperity. And if you ignore the truth by sitting there waiting for some preacher to preach to you, you will fail. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough to tell you the truth. Now listen, listen to what I'm going to say to you. I don't want to be mean. You can find churches that won't bother you. They're out there. This pastor loves you enough to bother you. This pastor is going to get in your face. And I don't know about you, but I wish somebody got in my face when I was young and told me the truth and stopped playing those stupid games. Now today, we can ignore the word of God because here's how it works. The word of God only works when three things take place. Number one, you hear it. Number two, you receive it. Number three, you do it. You can hear it, not receive it, And you'll end up failing. You can hear it. You can even receive it and not do it and end up failing. The only way you can't fail is when you hear it. Listen to this. And you receive it and you do it. Because we can get into such a religious system that we hear it. We think we've done pretty good. We receive it. We can even quote it. We can go out in the car and talk about it on the way home but never end up doing it. There's people in the pulpits that preach the gospel all over the world, and I want you to know something. They know how to preach it. They've memorized it. They've quoted it. They've graduated from seminary school, and I'm here to tell you something. They don't do it, and they will die and go to hell. And I don't want you to do that. And somebody needs to love you enough that we cannot take the word of God and make it common. When you do, God's wrath comes on you. Now, 2 Kings 22, pop it up on the overhead. Watch this. Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book. 
that have been found. They found the word of God. They didn't know what to do with it. It had been hidden away for a long time. Verse number uh, 13, part B. Go to the next part. For great is the wrath. I should have highlighted the word wrath up there. Great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us. Why? Why? Why is it aroused against you? Why is it aroused against me? Because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do. Let me tell you something. I can tell you how much I love my Deborah, but until I do my love, it's just cheap words. I love her, I must do my love. It's the same thing with God. So many times we don't understand that. So many times we'll say to God, God, I love you. And God says, if you love me, what does he say? You'll keep my commandments. He's not talking about 10 commandments. Come on, grow up. He's talking about New Testament scripture. He's not talking about 10 commandments. He's talking about his word. He says, if you love me, then don't just give me words. Put your heart behind it. Put your life behind this. Learn how to live by what God says in your marriage and so on. I can go to Deborah every day and say, Deborah, Deborah, I love you, I love you, I love you, but never do what God's word says. We would not be married today. It's true. I am preaching it. <laughs> to do according to all that was written concerning us. We've got to not ignore the word of God. It's got to be first and foremost. We've got to realize this is so important. We've got to realize somehow the power of God backs his word. And when I apply it in my life, he gets in there and changes it. So important. Come on, somebody. The second thing, how we're talking about what ignites the wrath of God Number one is ignoring his word. Number two, I love this one. This is so, this is so interesting. This, you'll love this. Listen to this. Being deceived by men. Following to sin. In other words, you do not have to be deceived. Debbie and I were talking about this between the first and second service. She brought up this all goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Here was, here was, here was, here was Adam standing there while Eve made the mistake of partaking of the tree of good and of evil. And he knew that she shouldn't partake of it. And she did. And he was probably thought about it and saw that it was, he, she lived and so he partakes. Why wouldn't he just say, wait a minute, girl. God said, don't do it. And I'm not going there with you. What makes everybody mad about this is he didn't have to do it. It was his call. So what we think is those that deceive you, God is really mad at them. Can I tell you something? If you follow somebody who is deceiving you, God is angry with you. You don't have to do it. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. This is so important for you to understand. You love men, but you don't put your trust in them. Hear me. You love men, but you don't put your trust. Your trust is only in God. A man go crazy, take you, make you go to Ghana and drink grape juice. <laughs> and did you know that the wrath of God certainly came on that guy, but also everybody that followed him, they didn't have to follow him. They let themselves get deceived. You don't have to let yourself get deceived if you'll bounce everything off, number one, the word of God. Yeah. Is anybody listening? Sometimes we think, well, I don't know. I, I just, I, you know, what, what, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I just went to that church because everybody went to that church. I, I thought it was okay. Can I tell you something? Stop letting yourself be declared in the heavens as a stupid person. You don't have to be stupid. And sometimes we act so stupid. If a whole group of people go, we don't have to go with them. I don't even care which way the church goes. I'm following God. 
Don't follow me. You're not here to put your emphasis on me. Don't put your trust in me. I could go crazy. I must be half crazy anyway to preach this many times at my age this weekend. But don't put your trust in me. Put your trust in God. Love me, but trust God. And we let ourselves be deceived by men all the time. And we think, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. I just went, I just went there. I know everybody else was going there. Oh, wait a minute. You're just as responsible. You know what really gets me? I'm going to talk to you about something. I'm going to let you in on something, how I really feel. I probably am meddling right now more than preaching. I cannot understand for the life of me when a pastor runs off with his secretary how the church doesn't get up and leave. It just keeps going on like nothing happened. Hello! You're following a sinner that's going to go to hell. And when you're following somebody that's not going anywhere, guess where you're going? Nowhere. And I cannot understand it for the life of me. Well, it's not my problem. It's his problem. If you let his problem get into your life, it becomes your problem and the wrath of God's waiting for you. Now, that's why we're shouting about the rock. Because mama loves me. Mm -mm, And I love her. Let me put it in real terms. Grandpa loves grandma. Grandma turns on grandpa. (laughs) Not very often since I got old, but it's still there, you know what I mean? (laughs) It's kind of, it's kind of like, well, I won't go there. I got to drive home with her. I'm in love. I'm more in love with her pushing 70 than I was in love with her when I was in my 20s and 30s. It's the way it ought to be. It's what happens when you have God. My kids are all serving God, preaching the gospel. My grandchildren are practicing being preachers. My God. You talk about wealth. I'm a wealthy man. I don't give me that money stuff. I don't care about That's real wealth, my friends. This is a place going somewhere. And it's just begun. And that's why if it's a place going somewhere and you want to go somewhere, hook on. Get ready. Let's go. But don't let men deceive you away from the blessings that God has for you. It's not their fault. It's your fault for letting it happen. Let me read you a verse. Is anybody listening? So important for us to see. Go with me, if you will, to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Excuse me, fifth chapter. Ephesians 5, verse 6, says it like this. Let no one deceive you with empty words. That means in the New Testament, people who believe in Jesus Christ, because that's who it was, he's writing to the church at Ephesus. He warns them, he says, don't let anybody deceive you with empty words. Do you know how easy it is to be deceived by people who say what they say with great enthusiasm and insight and absolutes and when in fact it's wrong? We follow politicians all the time. We believe them. It never seems to change, does it? Even though it's change is coming. No change. Yeah, it was a change for the worst. We need to be a people that understand that we don't be easily deceived with empty words. Listen closely to what says these words. He says, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the person who deceived you. Does it say that? No. The wrath of God comes upon who? The sons of disobedience. Those that follow the guy that deceived you. You say, well, how do I not be deceived? Go back to number one. Don't ignore the word of God. The word of God tells you everything. You know where you're safe and what's right. What's the heartbeat of God? What is the challenge of God? You want to know. If you don't know the word of God, you're going to follow someone's emotions. 
Is anybody listening? Come on, somebody needs to tell you this truth. They love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Three things we're talking about. Number one, what ignites the wrath of God. Number one, ignoring his word. Number two, being deceived by men to follow to sin. Number three, I love this one, not believing in Jesus. Oh, hear me. Not believing in Jesus is not head knowledge. It's about the heart. Listen to me. Nothing works with God until it comes out of your heart. Not even a cry for mercy until it comes from your heart. That's why he says the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. They avail because they're fervent. It comes out of the heart, doesn't come out of the mind. In the original text, the word gnosis means mind understanding, mental understanding. The word epinosis means an understanding from the heart. Are you following me? Gnosis is what a lot of people have. They have an understanding of who God is in their minds, but it hasn't dropped into their life and become part of them. When I was a little boy, let me explain it like this so you can understand. I always use this illustration. My mom and my dad, when I was little, taught me how to tie shoes. They said, here's what you do. You go around like this, and you hold it, you pull it tight, and I practiced. I went around, pulled it tight, hold it, pulled it tight, and I practiced. Went around, pulled it tight, and I practiced. Then one day, Mom was talking to me, and I wasn't looking at my shoes. I was just tying my shoes, and I was carrying on a conversation with her. Then my brother and my dad said something, and I said something to him, and I reached over to the other shoe without even looking, and I just tied it without even looking. Before I was practicing around, around, put tight. All of a sudden, how to tie the shoe went from here to here, and it came out of my heart. To this day, you can tie your shoes without even looking at your shoes. If you floss your teeth every day, you don't even have to have a mirror anymore. It's in your heart. You know how to do that. For the four of you that do that. <laughs> I like to play it, sorry. So, I, you know, it's a very serious message. You've got to have some fun. So it comes out of your heart. The things you do with God, when they become so part of you, doesn't just come out of your head, it comes out of your heart. When it comes out of your heart, then it changes the world you live in. And that's what believing in Jesus is all about. People who don't believe in Jesus, the wrath of God. Now, don't believe in Jesus. If you ask somebody, do you believe in Jesus? Everybody says, oh, yeah. Do you know Jesus? Of course. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. Of course, every worst question you can ever ask a human being is, do you believe, do you know Jesus? They all know Jesus. Yeah. You wouldn't be in this room if you didn't know Jesus. But for a lot of you, you got him here. And he hasn't dropped down here. And until he drops down here, you're really not a believer because your life doesn't back it. And when you die, if you die like that in that condition, somebody needs to love you enough to tell you you're going to go to hell. And it's not the will of God for you to do that. Hell wasn't designed for you to do that, to go there. But you're going to go. And somebody needs to tell you, it's not what you have in your head that counts. It's what's in your heart that counts. This is about believing with your heart. Is anybody listening to me? Now look, at, in John, the third chapter, verse 36. I don't amount of time. Just pop it up on the overhead. Listen to what the word has said. It says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. You know what's really interesting if you stop and think about that? The people that don't believe, they seem like they have a lot of life. They have more money, fancier cars, greater homes. They seem to be doing everything right. But guess what? It's not the life that has the depth of God. And that's where real wealth comes from. Now listen to the words. But the wrath of God abides on 
him. Ooh, not just around on him. That'll keep him from your personal promised land. God wants to take you somewhere. Three things we learned about what ignites the wrath of God so we don't have to do them. Number one, ignoring his word. We got to make an emphasis of his word. Every time we gather together, we need to find out what the word, I don't, can I tell you something? I don't give a flip what men have to say. I really don't care about your opinions and ideologies and philosophies. I really don't give about your psychological insights. I want to know what Jesus says. That's what I want to know. So we got to make that a priority in our life. Number two, you're going to have to not allow, because of wisdom of God, men to deceive you. When you get deceived, it's your own fault because you didn't have to go there. When you got into sin, the Bible makes it very clear that you do not have to follow those that are sinners. You don't have to. You're free. Follow God. Thirdly, we're going to have to believe in Jesus. With all of our heart, not just with our head. We'll take care of that in just a moment. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. I'll let you go in just a few moments. Listen closely. Everybody remain seated. Nobody else get up. My goodness, hundreds of you got up. What a shame. I know there's speakers outside and you're listening to me right now. I know there's, I even had speakers put in the bathroom. I know you can hear me. Get back here and get right with God. Let's talk just for a moment. Worst thing could ever happen is you come in here, we laugh, you hear the word of God. And you were great listening to the word of God today. Listen, you were good. You heard something. God spoke to you today. It's not my words that you heard, but something in your heart from the Holy Spirit. That's what this is all about. And you were great. But one of the worst things that could ever happen is that you die in the next few minutes and you go to hell. You walk to your car, your heart stops or you whatever, and you're... You end up opening your eyes in hell. Because you can't get to heaven because you're in this church. You get to heaven because you're right with God. Some people, here's maybe this is you. Some people think they're going to go to heaven because they're good. Nowhere in the Bible says you get to go to heaven because you're good. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's Hollywood movie stuff, but not in the Bible. Some people think they're going to heaven because, you know, they're nice or they're friendly or... You know, the police aren't chasing them. They fit into society or social system. Nowhere in the Bible. Some people say they're going to heaven because, you know, they just hope they're going to make it. But nowhere in the Bible does it say whoever hopes the most gets to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Some people say to themselves, well, you don't understand, Pastor Jim. I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God. Nowhere, not in the Bible, says you get to go to heaven because you love God. Some people say to themselves, well, hold on a minute now. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They took me to catechism class, Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Put a cross, St. Christopher, around my neck. Had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Hey, cool. That's great. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you got christened or baptized, your mom and dad put a cross, St. Christopher, around your neck, put religious jewelry on you, took you to those classes that bored your brains out, and you know it. Guess what makes you a Christian? Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. Some of you might say to yourself, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, I'm going to go to heaven. I, I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I was there for years, sang in the choir, man. I was a leader in the church. I taught Sunday school. I went to seminary school there and all that stuff. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible says you go to seminary school, sing in the choir, join the church, teach the Sunday school, whatever. You get to go to heaven. Not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Not in the Bible. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you. Jesus, who's a beaten, bloody mess, goes to the cross, nailed to the cross for you, raised from the dead on the third day for you so you could go to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, proving his deity so you can go to heaven. Now watch this. You think he just leaves up how do you get to heaven just for you, whatever you decide's okay? 
whatever you decide, that group's okay. You know, if they want to think of themselves as coming back as a lizard and growing to be a squirrel and finally eventually making it, that's okay, that's okay. Don't treat Jesus like he's an idiot. It's ridiculous. He goes to the cross and he tells you exactly how to get to heaven and you can't get there your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. John 3rd chapter tells you exactly what his way is. He says these words to a man who is probably better in his lifestyle than all of us. His name was Nicodemus. He says you must be born again. The bottom line, you must be born again. But the problem with that is, as most people in American churches really don't know what born again means. All they know about born again people is they don't like them. Hollywood's portrayed them as idiots and fools and radical, fanatical goofballs. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. So I'll tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. It means... You've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life because that's what he's after. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down. It's all or nothing and I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Man, what a crude, rude statement, Jesus said. I'll vomit you from my mouth. That, that, that's rude. But Jesus said it. He's blunt, like some people I know. And may I say this to you? What's that mean? It means this. Here's what he really just said. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Oh my goodness. Lukewarm, what's that mean? They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. I guess we better define what's lukewarm. A little in, a little out. Here's lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance, that's lukewarm. Hey, how about this? God is something in your life, but he's not everything. That's lukewarm. How about this one? You're not against God. You're okay with that, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. I'm speaking to some of you that are in here right now. And today, you can say, I believe in Jesus, but until you give him all of your heart, give him all of your life, man, you're not going to make it. And you know what's going to end up. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Today is your day of salvation. You have a divine appointment with God. You've had appointments with doctors, attorneys, and plumbers all of your life. But I'm here to tell you something. Today, God brought you here so that you would get right with God. And today is your day of salvation. And you have got to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. He's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He could make robots if he wanted to, but he didn't. He gave you a free will choice, and your choices will determine your destiny. And your call, it's your call, not mine. I've done my job. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I give God all my heart and all my life? Let's do it God's way, not my way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll, I'll confess you before my Father, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see it go up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, this family rooms are packed. I'm talking to you back there, all across the back of the auditorium, in the foyer by television, I'm talking to you. Wherever you're at, when you hear this, bang! 
your hand goes up and I'll see it. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is that you do not want to go to hell. You want to go to heaven and you want to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. You want to be born again and that's what it's all about. Jesus said, remember, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. I'm a man, I'll see it. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, again, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, again, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure today is your day. I'm counting to three, I've done my job. Sit there and do nothing. Or get your hand up and get right with God. I won't embarrass you, but even if you get embarrassed, it's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Today, this is your day. Ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, to one, to two, to three, to four, to five, to six, to eight, seven, to eight. Thank you. Anybody back in the family? Twenty eight, twenty nine. Thank you. Thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. Thank you, 35 right here. God bless you. 36, I see you back there. Anybody else? 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 40, a family room, 40, 44, and how many? Four more? That's 48. See, I know how to add. 48, 49, thank you, God bless you. If there's 49, there's 50. I already got you guys, already got you guys. If there's 49, there's 50. Where's 50? Are you pointing at 50? Where's 50? Wave at me, 50, I want to see you. Wait, I don't see you. Wait, oh, there you are. Got you, man, 50. All right, God bless you. 50. Anybody else? Anybody else? 51. God bless you. Going for God. Come on. Going for God. Not going to go to hell. I'm going for God. I'm going to heaven. And where are you? 51. Is that a hand back there? 52. God bless you. Thank you. I already got you. I already got you. I already got you. Oh, 50, 51. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 51. Yeah, ain't God good? Woo! <laughs> Thank you for letting me do that every service. You know, sometimes you guys go, oh, okay, here goes the altar call. Another 10 minutes of the same thing. But why change what works? If I'm catching fish on a certain bait and I'm catching fish, I ain't changing to some stupid lure. I'm going to catch fish. And I'm fishing, catching fish. 12,000 last year. We're going to break that record all this year. Is that all right? All right, now here's the deal. All 50 of you, just give me a minute more. All 50 or whatever it was of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can come too. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, get yourself. And nobody leaves during this period of time. Listen to me now. Nobody leaves. All of you that raised your hand, anybody that should have, get your friend, get yourself, whatever you need. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. You stand and welcome them. You come right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I live for alone every breath that I take Come on home. every moment I'm away Lord have your way oh they're coming give them a hand as they come Lord I give you my heart hurry 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 I give you my soul and I live for come on you. come on home <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. All right, everybody up here in front, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. I'm as weird as it gets in the entire church. I am the weirdo of the church. These guys are good guys. He's going to do three things. 
Let me tell you what the three things are so you won't think we're strange and you won't be uncomfortable. Number one, he's going to punch you right in the nose. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding you. You know, if kind of, man, I'm really scared, Pastor. And then you say something like that, it makes me crazy. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. He's not going to do that. Number one, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross because you need him. He comes in, he's a gentleman, because you invite him. You won't come in unless you invite him. He'll lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two, he's going to give you some free. I love the word free. The word free means free. Information, little pet booklets that we have to give to you. Only takes a few moments to read through them. You know what they'll tell you? Now that you're a Christian, what to do next? What does God want from you now that you're a Christian? It'll tell you what to do next. That's what the booklets will do, okay? Then he's going to introduce you to a spiritual personal trainer. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend. That's what we do. That's how we roll around here. We give friends away. They'll meet you before church, help you with scripture, go over some scripture with you, pray for you during the week. When you come to church, they'll buy you coffee, tea, or nachos just to meet with them a few minutes before. It's always fun coming to church when you have a friend becomes your place then. It only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Isn't God good? Woo! Come on, are you happy? Ha, ha, ha.